Today we're going to take a look at Funfair, a standalone game based on the theme park building game Unfair. Thank you Good Games Publishing for sending us a review copy of both games. Funfair was designed by Joel Finch, who was also the designer of Unfair. Features artwork by Lena Cassette, Dave Forrest. Funfair just hit the market this year in early 2021 and should just be showing up on store shelves about now. Funfair is meant to be a lighter and much less cutthroat version of the board game Unfair from the same designer and publisher. This makes it both more family friendly as well as a good entry point to the Unfair series of games. Now, Funfair plays two to four players and is all about building a theme park from the ground up starting with just one gate. This game is lightning quick with games taking under an hour with players who know the game. First game might take a little longer. Our first game with only two players did take about an hour max. Well, to get a look at what you get in a copy of Funfair from Good Games Publishing, be sure to check out our unboxing video on YouTube. Now, there are a few things I want to highlight here as well on the show today. Um, for one, this is a card-driven game. So the majority of the box is cards, uh, 150 cards. Uh, these are of great playing card quality and feature excellent thematic deep park artwork and even better iconography that is great and easy to read from across the table. There is a two-sided board included in this game, mainly to just hold the various cards in place while you're playing. And I got to say it's unique, and I think it's worth calling out because it's designed so that one side of the board all the cards face one way the other side of the board has half the cards facing one way and the other half the cards facing the other and which side you use is meant to be determined based on where you place the board so if you're placing the board in front of everyone you would face them all one way because if you're putting it between the players you would put it as facing both ways personally both Deanna and i found we liked all the cards one way it didn't matter how we were seated whether it was on the same side or opposite but i liked seeing that option yeah, it's nice to have that option depending on how you want to sit with your, your partner or opponent or whatever you prefer to call them uh, in a given game. <laughs> now, the next thing of note is the currency in the game. Uh, these are poker chip-like coins in $1, $5, and $25 denominations. These are thick cardboard tokens, really thick cardboard that came pre-punched. Now, not only is each of these clearly denoted by color, so they're easy to tell apart, they're also told apart by size and shape. The $1 is the smallest and round, the $5 is larger and hexagonal, and the 25 is even bigger and rectangular. This is some of the most accessible money I've seen in a board game. Great for people with color blindness or other color, or sorry, other vision issues. Now, what I wasn't impressed at all by was the box insert, especially when comparing Funfair to Unfair, which has a nice molded insert specifically designed to hold sleeved or unsleeved cards into separate decks. Here, you just get a cardboard trough divided into four parts, none of which are actually good at holding cards. I can only assume this was done to keep the cost on Funfair down to make this version of the game more accessible, so I guess that makes sense, but it was a little disappointing. Yeah, unfortunately, economy drives choices, and it is a tough one, especially when you're seeing both of them. Although yeah. I think because it is intended as a the, the starting point, it would actually kind of be nice when you moved from Funfair to Unfair to see that upgrade with the product. So yep. now, what is it we do with all these cards? All right, so each player starts a game of fun fair with a random showcase card. This is your, your big, expensive, themed thrill ride. There are four different ones, each with the four different themes in the game. You have a gate card that represents the front gate to your park that generates you one coin every turn. You get 30 coins and five random park cards. Now, the majority of the cards in the game are these park cards. They're a mix of attractions, upgrades for those attractions, and park staff. Now, attractions, there are various types. They include thrill rides, leisure rides, sideshows, theaters, and food outlets. Now, upgrades, these are played on top of attractions, include features, uh, things like the loop-to-loop -loop for a thrill ride or comfortable seating, which can be added to any type of attraction. Guest services, which include things like lockers and coat checks or an express queue. Qualities, uh, there are two different qualities included in this game. One's, uh, I forget, deluxe, and then there's another... Uh, slightly higher superior or something are the two qualities and then there are themes in this particular set there are four themes included fairy tale pirate jungle and robot themes 
The other type of cards are your staff cards. These give you a mix of in-game and end-game bonuses while playing. At the start of the game, you're going to draw one random award card. This is placed faced up on the board. This is going to give one player 15 points at the end of the game for fulfilling its requirement. These are always based on like a most or least of something. So they include having like having the most themes used in your park or having the most quality upgrades in your park, etc. Each round of the game actually starts with players drawing the top city event card. There are one of these for each round of the game. These are all good things which is a big change from unfair from what I understand. These are all things that help the players. They're going to be cards like Surprise Gift that gives players a free card from the deck that they can either keep or swap for one in the market, or a change of plans, which lets you discard part cards from your hand and draw new ones. After resolving the city step, you then move into the part step, and this is the meat of the game. Here, players take turns taking one action at a time. In general, players are going to start with three of these actions, though building that showcase ride I mentioned earlier does unlock a fourth action each round. Now, the actions include build. You pay the cost of one of the cards in your hand or one of the cards in the central market and put it into play and do what it says on the card. Now, there are spot in your park for five different attractions, and each attraction can have any number of upgrades added to it, but never two of the same upgrade with the same name. Parks can also contain any number of staff cards. Now, while all upgrades include, increase the point value of your attraction at the end of the game, most of them also include some other special rules on them, like letting you draw more cards, get money back from the bank, pass cards to other players, and so on. Your next action is take. This is how you get cards. You either take a card from the central market and put it in your hand to save for later, or discard a park card from your hand to draw five random cards from the deck and keep one. The other th blueprint card, you're going to take two of these and keep zero or one of them. Now, blue cards are end game scoring cards, and these are going to be similar to anyone who knows Ticket to Ride, which I assume most people know Ticket to Ride at this point. They're going to have a requirement listed on them and a bonus. The requirement includes things like have a thrill ride with at least two feature upgrades, or have a theater that includes a theme, a guest service, and a feature, and so on. If by the end of the game, you fulfilled all of the requirements on a blueprint card, you score the points listed. But if you don't fulfill them, you lose 10 points. Now, if you have fulfilled all the requirements, each blueprint card also has a bonus section that you can only get if you fulfill it. So, for example, the blueprint that requires you to have a thrill ride and two features gives you a bonus if you also have a food outlet in play. So you get the, the basic points if you have the main thing and you can possibly earn bonus points. Now, each of these cards are ranked easy, medium, or hard and have point values associated with them based on how difficult they are to fill. Now, the blueprint action, it's worth noting, does become unavailable the last two turns of the game. This is well done in the game design-wise because there's a blueprint closing car soon card that you put in the city deck. And whenever that comes up, it warns everyone, hey, you got one more turn to buy blueprints. And then when you actually get to the round where they're closed, you actually flip the card over and says blueprints closed and you put it on the deck. So that was some, a nice piece of design that does a good job of indicating to players when and you can and can't buy blueprints. Uh, the next action is called loose change. Uh, this represents thematically scrounging around your attractions, looking for change, the fellow to people's pockets. Uh, you get a buck for every attraction you have in your park up to five. One final action exists, which is Demolish. This lets you remove a card from your park. Uh, there are a few reasons you might want to do this. For one, you can only have five rides, so you might want to, or sorry, I shouldn't say rides, attractions, because they're not all rides. You might have five attractions, and you might find something you want more, but more likely, you're probably going to do it to fulfill one of those blueprint cards, which will say something like, you need six of this, or you need four of this, or you need rides ranking one, two, three, four, five. And well, you, if you have a six, you might want to demolish a card. Well, that makes sense. So th there's quite a bit of... Um... You know, it's it's not quite theme park builder like the the old role playing game, the old uh, the old uh, video game PC game, uh, yeah. the old PC game. But uh, it's it's feeling a lot like that, and giving you that experience, but in a in a less involved, uh, you know, detail oriented aspect, right. more, more generalized card. Yeah, I can see that. I totally agree with that. So once everyone's completed their three or four actions, you go to the guest step. Here's where players make money. You get an income based on the star value of their attractions, which is just a number list in the top right corner of their cards in a star. Again, the iconography here is top notch. You're also going to get bonus income from stuff, some app members, the ticket holders they're called. For example, the cotton candy vendor will give you two extra coins for every leisure ride in your park. And there's a bunch of these for all the different types of rides. 
The other thing that happens in the guest is that outside investors you five coins the completion of your showcase ride. Now, these showcase rides, I mentioned this at the start of the review here, are big rides, right? They cost 20 bucks, which is a ton of money. They provide three income a turn, so they have a three-star rating, and they give you a fourth action every round. And a big part of the game is deciding when to build these because every round at the end of the round, you get $5 for free, right? $5 that goes towards building this. Do you want to wait until they're paid off or almost paid off? Or do you want to spend the money yourself early on to get that extra action and start generating that three income? That's a big decision in the game. No, absolutely. It's uh, there, There's some some fun things in there. And I like the fact that it's that sort of, you, you, you jump to, you don't have to worry about your... Uh, uh, worry about the people during the building because that's one of the the biggest problems mm -hmm. I think is with a lot of people with the theme park uh, video game is you know you have to open it up and get people in there right away but you're still trying to deal with the park itself and it over complete complicates things and they've taken that away by separating it here yeah and they totally abstracted it right like you just get a bunch of money this isn't like um dinosaur island is that the, yeah dinosaur yeah. island where you're drawing hooligans there's none of that there's no hooligans and good people and right. star guests it's just an abstract you add up your star rating get that much money uh finally there's a cleanup phase as you expect in many of these type of games the market's wiped it's important to know it's wiped every round so if you don't if you see something up there and you don't buy it it's gonna be gone uh players then do have to discard down to five part cards if they have more than that and the first player marker just moves to the left now this is going to continue for six rounds at the end of which you move to final scoring you get points for a bunch of different things here. I don't know if I quite call it a point salad, but there are quite a few different ways to get points. So the first and foremost way to get points is your attraction size. So each of your attractions, you're going to add up the icons on them for the attraction itself and for every upgrade. Now you're going to get points based on the total number. So these ramp up, right? So one with only three icons were 12 points one with fours were 16 right so you're only going up by four but as you get up to six it starts going up by five then it starts going up by six for example eight is worth 38 points now this track goes to 17 which i i don't know i don't even, I, I don't even i'd have to count the cards to see if there are 17 different upgrades you can put on one ride we've never seen it get that high we tend to like max out at six seven maybe eight you're then going to get points for blueprints. I mentioned these earlier, right? You're going to get points for having it completed. You might earn some bonus points. You're going to lose points if you didn't complete them. Every coin you have is worth, um, sorry, every two coins is worth one point at the end of the game. So your income from visitors is big at the end. All of the staff member cards are going to be worth points. Some are just worth a static point, three points or two points. But then there's going to be others that give points based on other stuff you have in your park. A big one of these are the performer cards. And there's one of these for each of the themes. So the robot performer, for example, gives you three points for every robot themed attraction in your park. Then there's the awards, which I mentioned earlier. It's randomized at the start of the game. It's going to give someone 15 points. Add all this up, player with the most points wins. Straightforward enough. So one thing I do want to call out here is an excellent fun for scorekeeping piece of software. Uh, this is something Good Games Publishing has posted online. Now, I wanted to call it an app, but it's not an app because there's nothing to download. Rather, it's just a web-based, you just go to a certain website, there's a QR code in the instruction book to get you there. And a uh, what I did is I just, you can shortcut any web page. So I put a shortcut on my phone and I just tap it. And it walks you through the scoring process and does all the math for you. You just enter the numbers. So it starts off, goes like ride one, how many icons did you have? Ride two, how many icons? Ride three and so on. Blueprints, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. And your bonus is earned. And like, like it does all the math in the background, which I thought was excellent. And it does a good job of it. Like it works really well. What I also thought was really cool is they, they, clearly explain this is that they are using this app to do research on the game to see what people scores are like to watch for any trends anything they can use to improve the game in the future and i thought this was really cool to see yeah so i mean i know in uh unfair they have put out uh, additional themes and uh you know uh, not dlc but uh, you know expansions to the parks uh, and it sounds like what they'll probably end up doing or what they're able to do here is if they put out expansions, they can balance that or rebalance mm -hmm. if necessary based yep. on how people have been scoring. Yeah. And the other thing I noticed with unfair with the expansion, they actually put out some errata cards that included right with the expansion to replace some overpowered cards. Now, as for my thoughts on this game, I'm going to say it. I don't say this 
straight off the bat very often, but I was extremely impressed by this. Like, like every aspect of it, this is just like, it's a good game. Like it just, there's just something about this game that feels very well done and it feels polished. Like it just feels like a lot of work went into this, that it's been tweaked and play tested and tried and tested and designed for maximum fun and playability. There's just a very finished feel to this game. And I think uh, realistically, I think we know why that's happening. <laughs> well, yeah, that, like a lot of this has to do with the fact that this is a follow-up and standalone version of Unfair, right? This is a game on its own. Unfair is very well regarded by a number of people. Uh, now, I admit, I've not played Unfair. I haven't tried this myself, but I will say that you know they took what worked from Unfair and used it to build Funfair. Now, I've also heard, and I don't know if this is true, but th this game was made as a direct result of people complaining about the unfairness of Unfair, which is supposed to be part of the game. It's called Unfair for a reason. Now, this includes the cutthroat player versus player nature of the game, but there's also more to it, which um, I saw a few people discussing on Twitter, is that Unfair is just mean. Like, there are event cards that come up that affect all the players that just ruin your plans and ruin what's happening. All of that nastiness has been removed from unfair and put into funfair, removed from funfair to make it more fun. Right. Like really the only way to do anything to another player is to perhaps hate draft a card, you know, they want. But even that though, I don't think it's a real valid thing to do because for one, there's multiple copies of most of the cards. So if they don't get it now, they'll probably be able to get it later. And pretty much anytime I played, it just seems way more valuable to take something that helps you than take something you don't want just to hurt someone else. It just doesn't seem like a valid option. You don't get a lot of actions in this turn, and having to use your action to hate draft just seems like a waste of an action in this game. Yeah, no, it's interesting, and I think I, I have to say I am probably going to prefer Funfair. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not a take-that player. I, I don't really yep. enjoy those games uh, for various reasons, um, you know, if I'm playing games with my friends, they're my friends. I don't want to be <laughs> attacking and, and bashing them up that much. I mean, it's, it's, it, there, there's a difference between, you know, playing something like a Fortnite where yes. you're out there to kill, kill people. But even that I'm usually on a team with my friends and I don't know the other people in front of me. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I realistically Funfair is probably going to be the game of this set that I'm going to choose as well. Yeah, and I definitely know people that be on the same side with you. Like, um, I remember sitting and playing Horizons with Ian at the local game store and throwing in the Extermination expansion and yep. hating it. Yep. Meanwhile, I preferred it with Extermination. So yep. this is definitely going to, to appeal to a different audience or perhaps the same audience. Mm -hmm. So getting back to positives here, um, design of the cards is top notch. Like, there's just, I don't know what research went into it, how many different trials they did, but it just works. Like, the iconography is really easy to read across the table, which mainly becomes important with those um, awards, who's winning the awards, so who has the most of something. Um, but it also is really great for just looking quickly down at your own cards to figure out if you qualify for a blueprint. Like, they able to look to see, does my ride have three features? Is a matter of, are there three uh, flag symbols in my row of cards? Like, it's really simple. Um, I also like the two-sided board. Like, that's just a nice touch. Mm -hmm. um, and, well, I already told you, the, the money's fantastic. Like, I, this is top-notch. Like, I get it. It could be plastic. It could be non-cardboard. That would improve it. But the design of that money is some of the best I've ever seen. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And I think um, because we are starting with the end, um, even though this is the gateway game, it has benefited from mm -hmm. the experience of the, the unfair uh, market research and, yep. and time. And they clearly want to step, put their best foot forward. So yep. they are, while they may have done things like the box insert is less than ideal. Yeah. The quality of the actual playing pieces, not the, not the box that you put it, put yes. it away in yeah, but the stuff yes. that you're using out there on the table is right up there with something mm -hmm. that you want more of. And so hopefully we'll find out that that all continues when we jump into un unfair at a later date. Yeah, true enough. Yeah. So like the, any complaints about the game, I only have really two. Uh, the first is that box insert uh, talked about it above. It's just, it, it's just, even if you're going to make a trough, make it the right size for holding cards. Like it's just, this is a card game with 150 cards and it's, why not design a box for holding 150 cards? It, it's a, it's an odd choice. Um, there are going to be people out there complaining 
of wasted space in this box. Um, it's not as a splendor level of wasted space, but there isn't a lot of air in this box. Um, and again, comparing this to Unfair, which again, this game came out after, even though this is supposed to be the intro, this game did come out after seeing that to this. But I get it, right? Like the point was, I'm sure the point was to keep the cost down. Like we were talking earlier about feedback on some of our Robotech reviews that um, the company Solar Flare Games specifically designed Force of Arms to be under 20 bucks, to be an easy entry point. I'm sure a similar decision went into making this game, that they wanted it to be at a certain price point. Now, my other complaint with this game deals with one card and a string of bad luck. I don't know. Uh, the card is the part so this staff member gives players two points for every blueprint they've collected during the game as well as it makes it so you can't lose points for having incomplete blueprints and we have found that if a player gets this early in the game especially in their starting hand they are almost guaranteed to win because all they have to do is the blueprints not have to worry about fulfilling them or not so we're two points no matter what and then still be able to fulfill two three four or as many as you can the, there was one game where Deanna scored 95 or 150 points, like two thirds of her points just due to blueprints in that card. Now there's only one copy in a deck of, well, it's not a deck of 150 park cards, but it's maybe a hundred cards of the park cards. Like, so you got like a one, one in a hundred chance of drawing that card in your starting hand. But if that does happen, it just seems a little overpowered. So I, I we've actually seen that happen twice now. So I don't know. As, as a host rule, I actually recommend just either pull that card out when you're handing out your initial cards, or if you happen to draw that one, just shuffle it back into the deck. Just for that first round. If it comes up the first round, throw it back in, because later in the game, you're not going to hoard the cards right from the start. That Just one card. That's one where I wish I could put in that scoring app where they're collecting all the data somehow put what cards we drafted because I, I wonder if anyone else has seen this now this game's so new i couldn't find anything on board game geek no one else complaining about this there are some reviews out there i didn't see anyone else calling this out so maybe it's just like deanna has ridiculous luck because this happened to her twice i don't know what it is i wonder if um if you shouldn't just um uh seed the deck so you know do the shuffle do a do a cut throw him in there and then uh, and yeah, it's, it, I don't know. I don't know if it'd be it'd be too punishing to put him in the second half, so he wouldn't be worth it at all buying. Because it's mm. not a cheap card, but just you just hoard all the blueprints. Right. Like it, it's it's at the point where like the the scoring app only allows you to put six in. You could collect. Excuse me. The scoring app only allows you to put six blueprint cards into your into the scoring app. But what if you have seven or eight? Because you could do that with this card. Is there? A I don't know. Well, if, if the game, if the app only allows you to do so many, is there something extreme that you, uh, we didn't miss? <laughs> see anything. I, I will admit our first play, we did miss the fact that it's um, when you draw two blueprints, you can only keep one. We thought it was, you could keep one or two, right. but that I mean, we fixed that. Right? right. And then it happened again. We're like, I don't know. It's just that one card. I, and it didn't make me feel like the rest of the cards might be suspect or anything like that. It's just that one particular card. I don't know the cost. Again, I think it's just luck. It's, it's, the luck of getting that at the beginning of the game, which lets you gear your entire strategy towards that one card. Because it's another one of those where you don't even have to put the card in play until the very end of the game. So you can just hold on to that till the last round and decide if you want to play it or not. I just found it, like Deanna said, it's a string of good luck instead of bad luck. Well, bad right. luck for your opponents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Now, other than those two minor complaints, I love everything about this game. Like, I, I am... I kind of blown away like I, it's not often you sit down to a good game and you're just like oh that was a good game like it just had that feeling i think what i like the most though is to do this very fulfilling engine building experiences i built something i did something i've created something in about it very common in most engine building games especially uh bigger engine building games that when you get to the end of the game all you want is one more turn like, like to me, that's a common aspect of engine building games is the, oh, I just, if I had one more turn, I could have done so much of this. I could have, if I could have just ran it one more time and I always want that one more turn. And I didn't get that at all in Funfair. Actually, I got the exact opposite. Uh, it just feels like it was exactly the right length. Like I had just enough time to get the things in place I wanted to have in place. Like, no, not do everything I wanted to do because then the game would be easy. Like just enough to fulfill a couple of or maybe get 
for the bonuses for those blueprints or like i know i pushed my luck and took three blueprints and i'm taking a risk and it feels like oh i might be able to do it but i didn't but i don't feel bad about it like it just it feels like 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 of all the games we played sure we could play one more turn but at that point, it would just feel like everyone gets more points. Like, I don't right. think we would have made a significant change to our park. We right. just would have upgraded a few more things, gotten a few more points. Like, we had gotten to the end of that progression. Like, the timing is just perfect. And that's that's an important thing that doesn't happen all that often when it comes to games. So, to, to find out that they have managed to balance it so nicely is a really, uh, really speaks well to the design of this game. Whether it's based off of something else or not. Yeah. Um, they've done a good job. Yeah, like I said, it's, it's that that satiating feeling. Like it just you feel like you've done it. It feels like a bigger game. Like overall, I, this is a, a great theme park building game. I, I will honestly say the best theme park building game I've ever played. Not that I played a lot of them. There are a few <laughs> out there I've tried. Like this is it, it's filler level, right? It's it's less than an hour. You'd call it a filler, but it just it doesn't feel like a filler. Like right. it it feels very rewarding. Like I get the 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 experience of a big heavy game in a surprisingly short time period. And I find that like shocking, impressive. It's expertly designed, feels very polished. Now I'll admit, I I haven't tried Unfair, but I don't think it matters. Even if you played Unfair or not, I think this is a fantastic standalone game. This is a great weight game. It's a perfect gateway to hobby board games, I think, and engine building. Like in general, like this is going to be up there for me with um, games like Imhotep for a very st- different style of game, but like a, Hey, here's what hobby games can do. Check this out. You're going to feel like you built a theme park in less than an hour. I think that there is also enough here that experienced gamers are going to enjoy it. Like as a fan of heavy games, we we're t- earlier talking in this same podcast about arc rate and how much I enjoy it. I found this to just be fulfilling. Like it, it didn't feel like a light filler, lightweight. Yeah. It's a gateway game. It was enjoyable. I, I, I honestly can't help but recommend this one. Like of gamers of all experience level, I can't think of a group of gamers who are going to hate this. Right. Unless you just don't like hobby games. Like it's just one of those games that seems to, like it's up there with the Azuls and the, and, and the Emoteps, the, the games that I think are going to appeal to a very broad range of people. Amazing. Well, also be sure to check out our written review of Funfair by heading over to tabletopbellhop.com and clicking on reviews.